Greetings again in Jesus' name. You can contact me on my website at standinthegap.org for all the latest updates. We keep it uh, updated and recent with a lot of files and information up there. You can click over to my YouTube channel from there. There's a link on there now, or you can read our essentials or mission statement and check us out. You can also contact me if you want to contact me personally, have any questions, like to talk to me on the phone or via Skype, please email me at my holding firmly at gmail.com account, not just post it on the blogs because we often uh, miss those or overlook them for a, for a week or so. So just please email me at my holding firmly at gmail account for any questions, personal things you might have. And if you just want to go to the YouTube channel, just go to YouTube and type in Mike DeSero holding firmly and you'll get a good selection of the videos uh, if you're not already subscribed or don't know any of the titles. Well, what I want to get into here is an appeal to those of you that are contending for the faith. Some of you follow the ministry, some of you don't. But many of you out there have left the system and are now engaged in a contending for the faith. They've got blogs, got websites, handing out material, witnessing to people, trying your best to bring people out of this system of lies. My efforts have been over the years to awaken people to this system of lies, give them that helping hand they need to come through that season of repentance, and then launch them on their own into the, into the battle against these spiritual forces of darkness in the system of error. That's always what I've tried to emphasize, is that we're up against not just a particular error of eternal security, or faith alone, or imputed righteousness, uh, or the tulip, or Calvinism versus Wesleyanism. It's a system of error that we're battling. It's a whole pile of theology from times past that's mixing truth with error on many people's websites and their blogs and the materials that they read and they promote that should have been thrown on the trash heap of history a long time ago. So what I want to do here is ask you, does it matter? In your own thinking, out of the system, contending for the faith, looking for sound teachers, and trying to put forth that sound message yourself in a balanced approach to repentance and faith proven by deeds, does it matter if we team up with ministries that teach, oh, some version of the corrupted nature? Maybe they don't teach moral depravity or original sin, but they still teach some kind of corrupted nature, or that God's got to make you willing, or He's got to lend you some kind of assistance before you can even make the effort to turn to Him. Whereas the Holy Spirit's convicting the world all the time of sin, righteousness, and judgment, God's always stretching forth His hand, but you, they still believe in some kind of edemic nature. Are they mixed, mixed in substitutionary atonement in some form? Either the penal substitution where God uh, provided Jesus to pay in advance and became sin and exchanged places with man and provided him his obedience and all that stuff. Or it's just the moral government where it's some kind of an appeasement of public justice. Or is it okay as long as they believe in holiness and loving God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, your neighbor is yourself? As long as they say that kind of thing, it's okay if they still believe in the moral transfer, the pre-forgiveness of sins, a little bit of election, and maybe predestination. Kind of like this one brother says. I'm going to read a couple of things from the brothers out there that are contending for the faith and have this really sorted out and really down pat. There are, there are a few of them out there. And he talks about here, would it surprise you that uh, these Bible pundits teaching these doctrines that I just went over, he goes of moral depravity, election, penal substitution, faith alone, limited atonement, he mixes them up. There, there's plenty more. But then they have no clue that what they're teaching is in error and casts a shadow on repentance and faith proven by deeds. See, that's the whole point. See, what I'm saying is it matters because all this... Even the hint of these things in the old holiness teacher's doctrines casts a shadow on departing from iniquity. And that's the key problem here in the stronghold in everyone's mind out there. Almost everybody that's in sin professing to be a Christian, which are multitudes and multitudes of people, not departing from their iniquity, never have crucified their flesh with his passion and desires, have, nothing, have no idea what purity of heart's talking about in the scriptures because they've come through their receiving Jesus under one of these fallacies. That's why it matters. That's why it matters. So he asked, can you preach a pure and holy message 
why you mix it with all these errors. You know, can repentance and faith, proven by deeds, be preached properly if you mix in substitution, atonement, instead of reconciliation, if you don't define the terms properly, if you don't understand the nature of man and the nature of sin and how it relates to repentance, if you preach some kind of moral transfer or pre-forgiveness of sins, or you mix a little bit of error in, like so many ministries do, can they, can they still preach a pure message of repentance? Well, he says no. But why? Because this is another gospel. It's a semi-holy message. It's kind of like one other brother said, which I'll, I'll read something that that's, he said here in a little while. Another one said about, it has an almost free will. The semi-holiness message is what the gullible masses out there have been clinging to for generations. Yet you come out of the system and you, see, you say you see the mess, you, you, see the, you see them mixing truth with error, but yet you still cling to ministries that teach all these forms of substitution or atonement or moral transfer, pre-forgiveness of sins, God had to obey for you, has to make you willing, all those type of things. And don't discern how that affects the overall scope of preaching repentance. See, man's nature has to be clearly defined and sin has to be clearly defined before you can pull down the stronghold in these people's minds that all think they're Christians and on their way to heaven because they've said, re repeated the words or received Jesus or some mission told them that they were okay. You've got to pull down that stronghold, cast it down to the ground, bring it all into the captivity and the obedience of Christ like that 2 Corinthians 10 passage says, before you can even begin to get that person into a proper understanding that he has free will and the ability to turn to God and seek Him in a season of godly sorrow and repentance. As this brother says, you take away man's ability, you take away his duty to obey and seek and ask and start, knock and strive, work together with God in the redemptive process, then what's that result in? No crucifying the flesh with its passions and desires. The old man is still alive and well. He's, he thinks he's redeemed. He's, the light in him is great darkness. Because why? The eye has never been plucked out like that Matthew 6.23 passage. If the eye is bad, the whole body is full of darkness. And how great is that darkness? So the old man's still alive. There's no purity of heart. Jesus is the substitute. You got pre-forgiveness of sins, so sin's not really an issue. So if we get into this pattern of sin, confess, sin, confess, which most of people get into that pattern under, these, under this mixture of error, then it really doesn't matter because, well, as long as you're on the confess side, when you die, you'll be okay. So that's the problem here in mixing truth with error. It negates true repentance because they all ignore the purity of heart that must happen in repentance. Without that, you enter that pattern of sin, confess, sin, confess. So I don't like to call it sin, repent anymore, because repent, in my mind, is turning from your sins and coming clean with God. And I know repent, in some people's mind, is just changing your mind about sin. But in my mind, it's what the Scripture says it is. So I don't like to call it that. So there, they enter that pattern of ruin in which they never get victory over their pornography, they never get victory over their drunkenness, they never get victory over their uh, addictions that they have, and they just enter into a state of hoping that that will happen someday. See, that's not redemption. Redemption is purity of heart, a faith working by love, purifying the heart through obedience to the truth. That's why repentance works. See, the word, when it says in 2 Corinthians 7, 10 and 11, Godly sorrow worketh repentance unto salvation, not to be re regretted, but the sorrow of the world worketh death. The word work there is the word work. It's a work. It's not the word energy in the scriptures where God gives energy to our faith, like in Philippians 2, 12 and 13, where it says, work out your salvation, meaning produce observable results. results. Bear fruit. Do something to show that it's, it, you're putting forth that effort. That's what, that's what the word is used. But in the next verse,